It probably won't shock you to learn that this was not supposed to be a two-part episode with each part running this long, hence why at the end of the last part and the beginning of this one we have the supplemental voiceover beat, and the rest is trying out the live camera stuff that I know looks a little wonky but is still theoretically supposed to get production going faster in the circumstances we have to work under now. On the plus side, probably helped at least part of it come out faster. On the downside, if you split the content like that too often, people start thinking you're only doing it because you want to increase your output and get more traffic revenue. Not that I don't actually need more traffic revenue though, seriously, that Patreon tag that's all over these videos comes with our deepest appreciation guys it's hard out here anyway at least one tangible benefit to the intermission is that in between time the flash actually got close enough to its digital release that better clips of it showed up online so more people could get into the discourse over the deep fake cameo stuff in the finale and the weirder parts of the rest of it that i initially avoided fully commenting on in this whole piece because it's hard to illustrate without a point of reference but now i have that so for what it's worth like i've said elsewhere yeah i agree this stuff is all ethically problematic and that scene is badly executed but also in the same way the flash isn't itself the worst thing the dc EU produced, this is hardly the worst thing in The Flash itself. I get why people find the whole moment grotesque and in terrible taste. At bare minimum, I think it's about the worst possible way to have gone about it, and including the shot of George Reeves is especially heinous considering what was involved in the rest of his whole life story in relationship to this role, and the fact that there was a movie about it starring an actor who was in The Flash. What? What's that? Someone's in need. <laughs> You can't see my penis, can you? But weighed against the rest of this thing, and where, again, only from my own appraisal, the ship on this ethically kinda sailed back around Forrest Gump, I mean, six of one, half dozen of the other, the philosophical and narrative implications for this particular film, the way it's essentially delivering a stridently regressive, reactionary polemic to its audience, not merely in just some conservative or return to tradition sense, but in making a moral case, however abstract, for gerontocratic fascism, essentially an argument for voluntary mass self-deletion of millennials and Generation Z in order to preserve the status quo, reinforcing that the impulse of youth to resist an established norm and push forward to change their future is a destructive tendency that needs to be violently stamped out for the benefit of elders who know best. To me, using a movie about a young superhero aimed at an audience of equivalent age to tell them to give up on even trying to have a better life, or life at all, because it might make Batman grumpy, carries a lot more moral unpleasantness than a poorly rendered CGI actor. If anything, I can see at least why it's there, and even what it's going for in terms of effect and aesthetic, apart from just Warner Brothers, while a lot of studios, but Warner Brothers especially, being keen for a long time to prove that they can use mocap and deepfake tech to revive nostalgia characters or moments and maybe whole features like this, the film reels to comic panels and crashing globes visuals plus rendering even the people they didn't need to fully animate to look painted immediately made me think they got stuck trying to deliberately style reference Alex Ross's retro mashup prints and his famous Crisis on Infinite Earths wraparound cover and stayed with that angle even if they never quite nailed it, and the thing is, I get that. If that was the case, I get the very specific nerve that Ross's style even before he started doing those specific prints touched for Boomer and Gen X comics fans when he really broke out in the 90s and the early 2000s, and in the past when, God help me, I more or less predicted a tasteful version of exactly this in one of the How to Fix videos five years ago. And, uh, you know, I know this is very me, but if it is me, yeah. I get estate permissions, pay the royalties, put a whole dedicated effects team on a job of building a 21st century version of that Forrest Gump technology and do one scene just lasting maybe a minute or less where the Flash briefly blinks into a scenario where Christopher and Adam West and Burt Ward and Linda Carter are the Justice League. Maybe use CGI, de-aging, whatever to imagine which actors from the same relative timeline could have played other members, sure. You don't tell anyone you're gonna do the scene, you don't put it in trailers, you don't do it at the end like, oh wow, these weirdly old-fashioned looking versions of the heroes showed up out of nowhere and defeated the bad guy. I know, it's tempting, but it's too much. This would be a short, one-minute breather moment, the precise equivalent of that bit in the first Bill and Ted where they stop over in Rufus's future. Linda Carter is still with us, so you get her to loop a line of dialogue or two where she's like Barry and then like John Wesley Ship or somebody playing that universe Flash comes out and, and then our guy is all oh hi I'm from a uh, different he's all I know son happens all the time and then our guy you know waves at the league and they all nod and he zaps off and we get one more big wide shot of those guys just chilling in the hall of justice or wherever just people would go nuts <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, that's where a lot of the emotive inspiration for that would have been coming from, and I imagine the same was true at some point here. The thing is, in the context where it's happening, as part of this big apocalyptic moment where there isn't even any real recognition, and one of the big look at this showcases is Nicolas Cage Superman fighting the spider, that's not even a reference to a movie. That's a reference to a 20-year-old Kevin Smith stand-up special where he talked about not making a movie. So not only can this not mean anything to the characters in this film, it can't even mean anything to the vast majority of people in an audience who just don't give two shits about weird nerd culture production history minutia, and we're stopping the film to score points about this internet drama shit? I mean, I'm as guilty as anyone, I guess, because I left the theater mildly happy at the time that it ends on this joke about George Clooney showing up instead of Ben Affleck as a final haha go fuck yourselves to the Snyder Cut jerk was, but honestly, why should that matter? Especially when it feels at odds with an argument the film seems to be having with itself over where it stands on that subject throughout, going back and forth on whether it's making a full break with the dark and gritty Marthaverse or embracing it while holding up the broken quasi-Flashpoint universe and its irresponsible alternative area is an example of why it doesn't want to be like other lighter superhero fare with a multipolar lack of grounding that clearly reflects a story so long in development that it was retooled and rewritten with a completely new direction, focus, internal logic, and even philosophy multiple times just to fit with the reigning genre mode of each new moment it almost came out. You can almost pick apart the whole sections where things jumped out from. Oh hey yeah, this is where all of those had to be Deadpool. Or this is where they stopped writing him like Chris Pratt and started writing him like Tom Holland. Or here's where Thor Ragnarok and then Infinity War came out. And yes, of course, that's once again something that cannot and should not be talked about without remembering that the main thing affecting all of this was that there was a plague and it blew up everyone's schedule for two and a half years. <laughs> The COVID pandemic isn't over. The COVID pandemic is still worse than you think it is. The COVID pandemic was always worse than you thought it was, and it's not going to go away, nor was it ever going to go away, by wishing really hard that it would, pretending that it was never there in the first place, or through any means other than medical research that was always going to take longer than you or I likely wanted it to, because that's how science works. The reason you might think that any of this is not the case is because the world around us has been asked to go back to normal, and most of us have been varying degrees compliant. Not because what any of us just said is untrue, but because we exist under capital Capitalism, mass media is very effective, and it worked on you. The fact is, there was a global plague, exacerbated by global institutional incompetence and uncaring that in addition to killing and disabling millions of us, effectively froze entire sectors of global economic commerce, specifically in media and consumer goods, for about two and a half years. And because the wealthy 1% of individuals and political institutions worldwide who lost out in that period financially decided that was quite long enough for their losses to continue, the rest of us have been all asked to not only go back to normal, but also to forget as quickly as possible that those two and a half years of global plague ever happened in the first place, or at least that it wasn't really that bad. Which is why most corporate entertainment media and entertainment media reporting that merely repeats talking points either without examination or with an agenda of its own never mentions it when talking about studio profits, corporate profits in general, box office, streaming numbers, TV ratings, company consolidation, audience tracking, wages, unions, spending, buying, all things directly related to and affected by the pandemic from the start and still affected in ongoing ways. Therefore, in the same way that you'd be very scared skeptical of any historical presentation about significant events of the mid-1940s that failed to mention, oh, and also World War II was happening, so that probably affected this in some respect, you should have that same skepticism and apply it to anyone talking about anything happening in business, politics, or culture that does not make, oh, also, that global viral plague probably contributed to this too, a central part of their thesis, because it is central to everything, whether we want it to be or not, for the foreseeable future. Thank you for listening, and stay safe. You have to remember that when this project kicked off, even though Zack Snyder was well on his way out with the good graces of Warner Brothers, the DCEU was still working to establish an identity primarily as an alternative to the Marvel-dominated superhero aesthetic of the moment, which was, at least in theory, a smart move. I mean, you need to offer something that people aren't necessarily getting from what they already have, and in that context, it's hard not to look at the way the film ultimately ends up presenting the 2013 younger version of Barry versus the main Barry is not simply responsible versus irresponsible, but a here's what we do and why we're better statement of purpose, with Barry number two standing in for the lighter, joke-telling, pop-referencing, doesn't-need-grittiness, MCU-style, poptimist protagonist many were saying the DC movies should be aiming for instead. And you can see where this might have been the main thematic point of the movie and dramatic throughline for the character. The whole point of making the central relationship of the story a double act between two versions of the same guy played by the same actor, because it's still pretty much there in the version we ultimately get. The two Barrys aren't really totally different. They're the same person, but the younger one is kind 
kind of a dipshit because he hasn't had to experience anything that made him learn to take life seriously or put anything ahead of himself. Older Barry is annoyed by him, the lesson here obviously being, oh wow, I thought taking away the loss and hardship from my life would make me happy, but instead it made me kind of a jerk and the world is worse off. Okay, that's conflict. That's actually moral and ethical conflict to grapple with. You can get a movie out of that and a strong reaffirmation of purpose. No, we don't need our brand of characters to be zany, wisecracking, zoomer teenagers in vaguely adult bodies like the Marvel stuff does. In fact, maybe there's a dark side to not taking things seriously and also maybe trying to reboot, rewrite uncomfortable things to make them cozy and conventional has unintended consequences for society writ large. I mean, that could have really been something to talk about, except the unfolding plot machinations of both this movie and the bigger DC Universe machine and its continuity mess gets in the way of it and the subsequent revisions and reworkings as that mess got messier really get in the way of it. You see, I changed the trajectory of my past and now my alternate self's a different guy. Again, conceptually, decent story. Doesn't just get to be the main story because all the tie-ins and multiverse stuff is the point of making the movie and thus a superhero adventure needs to happen, which means the plot complication of Barry 1 having to temporarily lose his powers while Barry 2 gets powers because we need a training, fest quetch, not telling someone all the details, etc. arc to happen in Act 2 so Barry 2 becomes Dark Flash can happen as a plot point and be the big twist reveal. I I'm really trying, again, not to make this sound as dumb and overcomplicated as it is for purposes of the episode, guys. And for that plot, which on its own, convoluted, but not too convoluted in theory, especially for a DC multiverse story, I mean, for fuck's sake, I followed Stranger, to play out the way it does, well, that means Barry 2 can't be as much of a problem as he needs to be for Barry 1's actions to turn him into himself, basically, to be thematically justified within the story. Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. The plot acts like Barry is a bad kid, but he's not that bad of a kid. His life isn't going badly, not being the Flash is working for him, his parents and his relationship with them are both basically fine, he's about to potentially be in a relationship with a woman Barry 1 is striking out with in his own timeline. Sure, he's kind of an idiot, but things don't go bad for him until Barry the original tries to give him powers and loses his own in the process. All the problems subsequently are our Barry's fault. It's all his fault. And I'm willing to put that on a certificate you can frame. Which again, extremely functional messaging, but for two different movies with two different narrative goals and two different lessons that can't reconcile one another. Is the story here, original Barry realizes from meeting second Barry that he did need to experience loss and pain to be the best Flash he could be? Because this guy is definitely not that. Or is the story, original Barry realizes that by trying to make Barry number two more like him, he's corrupted this poor kid and is eventually responsible for creating Dark Flash and thus the entire paradox loop in the first place. In which case, by the way, kind of sucks that Barry 2 has to die to fix all of this in either version, right? Like, even the movie points out that he didn't ask for any of this, and now the guy who showed up and messed with him in his life and is telling him he needs to rewind it so that their mother dies to make the timeline right again, you'd become a supervillain too in that situation, wouldn't you? No, I'm here to avenge him! Okay, but it seems like you're the one who killed him. Maybe so! And by the way, doesn't it feel like there's a really easy fix to all of this, right? Like, you've probably been thinking it the whole time, even if this is the first time you've heard the plot of this movie described. Why doesn't Barry number one just be the one who does the self-sacrifice instead? I mean, no, it doesn't fix the time paradox stuff, but that's not the point. You can do away with that another way. It's a movie. He defeats the Dark Flash somehow, but it means he dies, loses, disappears, whatever, and Barry number two in his time Line or now the timeline, you still get the necessary, okay, this is why we don't do this to fix every problem going forward, business for the canon, and then thematically you get some martyrdom equivalent exchange morality out of it. He does save the world and create a better life, but the price is he doesn't get to live it. Another version of him does, and Barry number two now has both a positive and negative example of the paths his life could take to judge and future actions by. I mean, it's not perfect by any means. I'm not here to say I could have done it better than the screenwriter, but I think it kind of works. Maybe, you think, right? But it doesn't matter because it needs to go the way that it did because plot mechanics, studio politics, actor contracts, and all the other clashing interests, even though both of these competing concepts are driving to the same end point with the same overall take home message to the audience. That the impulsive young hero with the bold idea to not simply thwart crime in progress or repair disasters after the fact, but actually change things at the source should have just shut up and stayed put like that stern billionaire father figure told him to because trying to change the world will make things worse. Hey, Scarlet. We have. Make us who we are. I can save my mom. I can save your parents. We can also destroy everything. What did you do? 
The lesson is never try. Literally the exact opposite of where Across the Spider-Verse lands on not dissimilar moral question. That film says there always has to be another way, never giving up and trying to force the system, the world, the timeline, the whole universe to be the better version of itself you know it can be is what makes a superhero super. This one says those are crazy, stupid kid impulses that need to be reined in before you break something important. I mean, is it any wonder which one resonated with a rising audience of today and which one has been completely rejected by that same audience? I thought if you knew, you wouldn't love me the same. I can't help the people I love the most, and they can only know half of who I am. I can fix things. I can save people. But instead, I completely broke the universe. As much as I'd like to chalk such culturally tone-deaf storytelling up to only the ravages of reboots and demands of plot mechanics, that The Flash is telling a regressive, reactionary, shut up and stop thinking better things are possible, you dumb kids type of story, largely as a result of trying to make narrative sense of things that most likely happened because reboot concepts and studio notes demanded it, when you pull back the view and look at the DCEU as a whole, those themes have always been a huge part of the stories getting told and the way they're told. With rare exception, from Man of Steel right up through Wonder Woman 1984 and now The Flash, these have always been primarily films about how not to use power, how change is bad actually, and how people with gifts or abilities that might disrupt or upset the status quo should instead find a box they can fit in to better enforce that status quo. Maybe not distinctly ideological beyond an expression of the time-worn trope that DC is about gods having trouble being men while Marvel is about men having trouble being gods, but it's there nonetheless. Man of Steel is about how Clark's powers are so out of control they're even painful to him unless he learns to tamp them down and then direct them toward only maintaining that status quo, not going out of his way to be too noticeable. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. As much as the franchise gestures towards some kind of philosophical argument about it, it keeps coming down to making that version of Jonathan Kent's arguments right up through Batman v Superman. Don't do the right thing, it might get complicated. No one stays good in this world. Wonder Woman has Diana learning that her presumed straightforward mission to thwart one villain and end a war is more complicated than that, just like her mom's kept telling her. You liar. I compel you to tell me the truth. I am. And then her sequel has her and the entire planet having to learn that even wishing for things to improve at all instead of just being happy with your given station in life is bad, and also apparently wishing to not live under occupation in a war zone is exactly as selfish as wanting to rule the world with nukes. I renounce my wish. You know, Aquaman kind of gestures at Arthur being a reformer king, but it's mostly about him accepting a destiny that he's been reluctant to take up, become a more traditional Aquaman, and it has no real questions about whether the Atlanteans are justified in being upset about humans abusing the ocean. Suicide Squad, the first one, doesn't really seem to be against the idea of abusing the carceral system for paramilitary purposes. It almost kind of argues that this is something like a good project. Both versions of Justice League, but more so the longer one, wants Cyborg to stop feeling bad for himself and realize his father was mostly in the right. I mean, it pretty much just keeps going like that with the exception of the original Shazam and Birds of Prey, and then the whole project starts to really fall apart, and not uncoincidentally, the Suicide Squad, the second one, is really where it starts being actively critical of authority in this broader mega franchise, and even there, it's the Peacemaker spin-off series where it really gets serious about it. I knew when you listened to that devil music! I knew when you shaved your body like a woman! I knew when you slept with the horrors of polluted blood! And men! And even more so when you conspired with the forces of Baphomet against the United States of America! And you know, I don't think that most of this was on purpose. As someone who largely by happenstance has sort of garnered a secondary reputation as a chronicler of the DCU in failure state in real time, I don't think that actively trying to make regressive, reactionary, authoritarian message movies was one of the things anyone involved did wrong or even did, period. But sometimes you catch a certain headwind and that's where you are as a narrative, whether you wanted to be or not. It's tough to jump off. What I have observed in some of my past videos
is that especially in the early Zack Snyder projects, even if it's debatable to call Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, or Justice League reactionary, they were undeniably reactive, as in much too much of their creative identity felt like reaction to what was happening in other superhero movies and other parts of the genre, rather than coherent organic development. The main thing working against the DCU from the start has been focusing on being not Marvel instead of anything in their own right. Reacting to or against the currently popular version of the genre instead of charting a genuinely unique path of its own. So as the MCU increasingly found its direction in upbeat optimism, DC went for dour nihilism. Marvel kept it colorful and maybe a little too safe, DC turned out the lights and drove off the rails. And if reflex contrarianism is that operating policy and Marvel skews broad to a family audience with a nominally progressive-minded ideological arc, mostly on track with parent company Disney's performative corporate liberalism, I mean, it's kind of inevitable that DC ends up with a superhero universe with chronic Reddit brain, mean-spirited, reactionary, backward-looking, petty and bitter. You don't owe this world a thing. You never did. This world was a beautiful place, just as it was. You could also destroy everything. Who decides that? all culminating in The Flash, a superhero movie about the boundless storytelling possibilities available within the medium that uses them as a vehicle specifically for telling young people that they're stupid, annoying, and dangerous for even thinking about changing the world, the future, or even making their own lives better. So is it really a surprise, honestly, that not only young people, the main audience for a movie like this, bounced off a story like that so hard? <sighs> you kids don't know what you want. That's why you're still kids, cause you're stupid. You're just a kid. There's no idea what he's doing. <laughs> Is it a surprise that everybody seemed to? With the world in the state that it's in, who wants to be told that hope is bad? That you shouldn't try to fix things? And that's probably not even the message The Flash wanted to send, especially since there's this bizarrely unaddressed plot point in the middle of it about Barry only saving one kid, but not the kid's dad, during the original Man of Steel and being haunted by it that feels like it was supposed to tie back to the save one person thing in Justice League that now can't go anywhere. Well, that was pointless. But that's what can happen when you're reacting instead of creating to tell a story. You end up with a reaction reactionary movie. One that tells the audience that a cruel, regressive narrative is supposed to be heroic and then wonders why they reject it. And when I look at the totality of it against the whole breadth of movie culture that exists in, in the same way Across the Spider-Verse felt like the movie of the moment, I can't imagine a film less of the moment a film that failed to read the room more profoundly than The Flash. A film about going nowhere fast that would rather go backwards and be bitter about it. <sighs> I can't lose one more friend. These scars we have make us who we are. <laughs> Shut up, little girl. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture.